Make a start this evening with singing number, number 580. A sovereign protector I have, unseen yet forever at hand, unchangeably faithful to save, almighty to rule and command. Page 410. Uh, we'll stand as we sing in place. singing. Let's just unite our heart together, please, in a word of prayer. Let's seek the Lord afresh this evening for his blessing and for his presence. Heavenly Father, we just come into thy presence again in the Savior's precious name. We thank the Lord for thy grace that finds us in the house of prayer. And, O oh God, we're here tonight as sinners signally loved. And, Lord, those whom thou hast set thy love upon from eternity past. What is man that thou art mindful of him? Or the son of man that thou shouldst visit him? Oh, we praise thee for thy great and wonderful plan of salvation. Thank the Lord we come to one tonight who has planned it all, even the giving of his own beloved son to come down to this earth and to be our saviour and to go one day to Calvary's brow there to lay down his life as our substitute. And oh, we praise thee tonight that Christ finished the work. Thank the Lord that he offered that one sacrifice for sin forever. And having done so, he sat down at the right hand of God. That tonight we have a living high priest. We have a living king. We have one who is uh, enthroned above. And one who lives in the power of of an endless life. And Lord, we pray, that thou would, Lord, presence thyself with us, that by the power of thy Spirit tonight, we have no desire, Lord, just to go through the motions of some religious exercise, but, oh, that thou wouldst come and be one of our number. Thou would, Lord, come and help us in prayer. Lord, that thy Spirit would give us those petitions that we ought to bring before the throne of grace, knowing that thou art one who hears and answers prayer. Thine ears are open unto the cry of the righteous. And Lord, we thank thee for the righteousness of Christ that has been led to our account. Thank you, Lord, for every child of God tonight, head bowed in thy presence, having a desire to meet with the Lord. 
and O God to supplicate the throne of grace. Bless every soul, thou knowest every need, thou knowest Lord every pang of the heart and O God we ask that thou would meet us even at the point of our need, thou would give us a little word in season. Lord we pray that the word might run and be glorified. Bless thy servant on vacation at this time, refresh him in body and soul and mind. O oh God, be unto him what he needs. Thank you, Lord, for his ministry week by week in this place. And we ask, Lord, that I would encourage him and he might come back, Lord, empowered even for the winter's work. And Lord, that I would be pleased to bring him back even to a time of blessing. Oh, maybe here in his absence of God moving amongst his congregation. And Lord, we pray that thou would add unto the church such as should be saved. Lord, restore that which is backslidden and cold and edify the saints of God. Now, Lord, hear our cry, not forgetting those who, uh, Lord, we would say we miss them uh, from the prayer meeting tonight. Uh, Lord, through illness or uh, infirmity of the body. Or, Lord, those uh, duties, Lord, even to look after a loved one. Lord, we pray that would draw near to such and they might have a little portion of thy blessing even this evening hour. So Lord, abide with us now. Lead us out after thyself. Help us, Lord, as we read the scriptures. Give us understanding, Lord. And Lord, later on, help us in the place of prayer. For we ask these mercies in our Savior's name. Amen. Isaiah chapter 45, please. Just want to turn you there. I'm going to read just some of the opening verses uh, from this uh, chapter. Isaiah chapter 45, and beginning at the first verse. <clears throat> Thus saith the Lord to his anointed, Cyrus, whose right hand I have holden to subdue nations before him, and I will loose the loins of kings to open before him the two leaved gates, and the gates shall not be shut. I will go before thee and make the crooked places straight. I will break in pieces the gates of brass and cut in sunder the bars of iron, and I will give thee the treasures of darkness and hidden riches of secret places, that thou mayest know that I, the Lord, which call thee by thy name, and the God of Israel. For Jacob, my servant's sake, and Israel, mine elect, I have even called thee by thy name. I have surnamed thee, though thou hast not known me. I am the Lord, and there is none else. There is no God beside me. I girded thee, though thou hast not known me, that they may know from the rising of the sun and from the west that there is none beside me. I am the Lord, and there is none else. I form the light and create darkness. I make peace and create evil. I, the Lord, do all these things. Drop down, ye heavens, from above. Let the skies pour down righteousness. Let the earth open. Let them bring forth salvation. And let righteousness spring up together. I, the Lord, have created it. Woe unto him that striveth with his maker. Let the potsherds strive with the potsherds of the earth. Shall the clay say to him that fashioneth it, What makest thou? Or thy work? He hath no hands. Woe unto him that saith unto his father, What begettest thou? Or to the woman, What hast thou brought forth? Thus saith the Lord, the Holy One of Israel, and his maker, Ask me of things to come concerning my sons, and concerning the work of my hands, command ye me. Amen. Just ending at the words there at the end of verse 11. We know that the Lord himself will add his own divine blessing upon the reading. There are many women those occasions when the people of God go through trying circumstances. And the question may be asked all too often why these things are happening. It's then more so than ever that we fail to remember that the Lord is in control of all things. What this world or its media fail to recognize is that there's a higher power than any president, any king, 
or governor, no matter where they may be situated in the world. They may speak of the world powers. They may speak of the great leaders that sometimes are read together and come together for their conferences. But what are they in comparison to the sovereign God who is above all things and over all things on this earth? Behind the rise and fall of kings, thrones, empires, there's an unseen and a powerful hand of God. None can stay his hand or say unto him, What doest thou? You might remember the words of the psalmist in Psalm 75, 6 and 7. You'll find it. For promotion cometh neither from the east nor from the west nor from the south. But God is the judge. He putteth down one and setteth up another. And all the workings of God are for his glory. And for the deliverance of his people. Behind all the powers in this earth. Whether they desire to acknowledge it or not. Makes no difference. There's a sovereign God. God who is bringing to pass his perfect will. He's working out all things for the good of his church. And through affliction, through tribulation, through chastenings, the church of God is being perfected and being prepared to inherit the kingdom and to reign with Christ one day. That was the message that Paul and the apostles preached to the new converts in Acts 14. I'll just read to you verse 22. It says, Confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith, and that we must, through much tribulation, enter into the kingdom of God. There's the must. There's the must of tribulation. But there's also the entering in. Don't miss that. And that tribulation is certainly seen when we consider the nation of Israel in the time of Isaiah, which we have read just a short passage tonight. And it is to what seems to be a contradictory verse that I desire to turn your thought and your attention to, as you'll find it in the words of verse 3. And I will give thee the treasures of darkness and hidden riches of secret places that thou mayest know that I, the Lord, which call thee by thy name, am the God of Israel. Here are words not only spoken to a monarch, but men and women, surely they are words of encouragement to our own soul tonight in the midst of a dark age. I want you to think just for a moment on the context. In order that we might grasp something of what God is saying to our hearts tonight, we actually have to get a a grasp of the context, the background. And the background is this, the nation of God's people were in captivity in Babylon. And these verses reveal to us what God said to one by the name of Cyrus, a king of Persia. Now you'll note that he is termed as one anointed. Thus saith the Lord, verse 1. Is not what we want to hear. Thus saith the Lord. It's not what man says. It's the word of the king we want. And thus saith the Lord to his anointed. He's called God's anointed. Not because he was anointed with physical or material oil as the kings of Israel or Judah were, but because here's a man that was appointed. Here's a man that was set apart. And he's set apart by the Lord to be a king. And he's qualified by him for that very office. He's raised up by him to be an instrument of doing great things. Particularly in context of the deliverance of the Jews from their captivity. And bringing them back again to their own land. He was both designed and qualified for this great service by the counsel of God. He's given that title because even though he didn't realize it, God was to use him for the setting free of his people. 
And that, of course, is not something that is strange or unusual when you consider the scriptures of truth. You might uh, think of the Philistines. And the Philistines were a perpetual enemy of the, of the nation of Israel. But men and women understand that the Philistines were permitted by God to afflict the nation of Israel so that they would be driven back to their God. And that the Lord would raise judges among them to liberate them from their oppression. And here was a heathen king whom God was to use for the sake of his own people. And he tells Sarah that message. Look at verse 4. Uh, for Jacob my servant's sake and for Israel mine elect, I have even called thee by thy name. I have surnamed thee, though thou hast not known me. And there's a lovely and a great thought there. If God could use this man, though he says, though thou hast not known me, then how much more will God not be able to use those of his covenant of grace? Those who are his redeemed. Those who have been redeemed with the precious blood of Christ. You see, we worship a God tonight. We have a God tonight who knows each of his children by name. Isaiah 43, just back a page. But now thus saith the Lord that created thee, O Jacob, and he that formed thee, O Israel, fear not. Listen, for I have redeemed thee. I have called thee by thy name. Thou art mine. Is it lovely to be able to identify with that? The Lord can say to us tonight, I have redeemed thee. I have called thee by thy name. Thou art mine. <coughs> and yet we're looking at a heathen king tonight. And one whom God set apart because he was going to use him to deliver his people. And if God can do that through a heathen king, how much more can he not use you and me? Whom he has called by our name. You think of Moses. Moses, as he was commissioned to lead the children of Israel uh, out of the land of Egypt after the sin of the golden calf in particular. We read of that in, in Exodus chapter 33. Let's listen to the words of verse 11. It says, The Lord spake unto Moses face to face, as a man speaketh unto his friend. You know, that's, that's a lovely description of prayer, isn't it? We're just coming before the Lord face to face, friend to friend. And he turned again into the camp. But his servant Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, departed not out of the tabernacle. And Moses said unto the Lord, See, thou sayest unto me, Bring up this people, and thou hast not let me know whom thou wilt send with me. Yet thou hast said, I know thee by name, and thou hast also found grace in my sight. And God, uh, Moses had heard God say to him, I know thee by name. It's repeated again in verse 17. God was guiding him. And he had a man who would take over from Moses in leadership when Moses wouldn't go into the land of Canaan because he had smitten the, smitten the rock. And even though Moses wasn't discerning enough to know who it was, even though he didn't realize he was a man before his very face, that was Joshua. The truth that we are known of God is not confined to the Old Testament, of course. You think of the shepherd. John 10, for example, is a great chapter, the shepherd, the sheep. And the sheep know their voice, know his voice. And they follow him. I don't need to tell that the shepherds and the farmers in this area who have the sheep. And I, one of my sons, he's into that business as well, like a sheep around him. And they know the shepherd's voice. They know the voice of the master. How near how dear are we to Christ? Isaiah 49, I would love you to turn to it, verse 16. He says, Behold, stop and think of this. I have graven thee upon the palms of my hands. Thy walls are continually before me. Thy walls. That's not in the physical sense, although the illusion there is taken from the great walls of the holy city. The metaphor seems to be taken from the architect. And the architect has a plan of a building or a house or a city and its walls in his hand or they're lying before him. 
And the phrase denotes the constant care and the constant concern of God he has for the protection and for the safety of his church. He says, I walls are continually before me. Before his people. He's here, dear child of God, we're never forgotten. I'll never leave thee nor forsake thee. But furthermore, this Cyrus was a king whom God would use as an instrument in his mighty hand for the deliverance of his people from the fortifications of Babylon. At that time, it was an immensely powerful city. It had a circumference of 45 miles. Its walls were not only thick, but they were extremely high. And beyond those walls were the nation of Israel held in captivity in what must have seemed to be like a concentration camp. And they were captive for 70 years. But the power of God was greater. And he was to take this king by the right hand. He was to strengthen him against the enemies that held God's people captive. If you look again at the words of verse 1, you'll uh, have a clue as to when this was to take place. Thus saith the Lord to his anointed to Cyrus, whose right hand I have holden to subdue nations before him, and I will loose the loins of kings. To open before him the two leaved gates, and the gates shall not be shut. And if you have a marginal Bible, you will see a reference there that brings you to Daniel chapter 5. There's the clue. Because Daniel chapter 5, we have the passage where the king Belshazzar sees a writing on the wall. He's having a great drinking session with his cronies. And all the high men and all the lords and all the rest of them, verse 4, they drank wine, they praised the gods of gold and of silver and of brass, of iron, of wood and of stone. God says, there's none beside me. I am the Lord. And so we have the fingers suddenly appearing of a hand and start to write on the wall. What's the the effect of that? Verse 6. Then the king's countenance was changed and his thoughts troubled him so that the joints of his loins were loosed. And his knees smote one against another. It's the very same phrase. Cyrus, I'm going to take you and use you. I'm going to take you by the right hand and you're going to loose the loins of kings. He was to be terrified. Belshazzar was terrified, of course, when he saw that writing on the wall. His very loins loosed. Everything that was said in Isaiah 45 is to come to pass just over 200 years later. The sovereign God is faithful men and women to his word. And he raised up this heathen king to do his work. The cities would surrender before him. The gates will be opened. A long journey homeward would be made easier as God would straighten out the crooked places. No opposition would stand in their way and God would give to Cyrus the hidden treasures that were in Babylon, taken from the other nations. The gold, the silver that was buried, the vast wealth that would be all his. You see, the Lord is no man's debtor. And his wages are good, unlike that of the devil who seeks to damn souls in a Christless eternity. Cyrus was to be much better off when he did the work of the Lord. And you know, he was a man who acknowledged the hand of God in it all. All right, go back uh, to Ezra, chapter 1. You come across him. Verse 1. Now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled. The Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and put it also in writing, saying, Thus saith Cyrus, king of Persia, The Lord God of heaven hath given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he hath charged me to build him an house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Who is there among you of all his people? His God be with him. 
Let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and build the house of the Lord God of Israel. He is the God which is in Jerusalem. God's word comes to pass. Here we are reminded of the God who is in control of all things. Who can move the hearts and the minds of those in power to fulfill his purposes. The nations in God's sight. As you've seen them represented there a few days ago at what they call the G20. They're just as a drop in a bucket. That's what God says. Our God is upon his throne. No one can as much lift a finger, however powerful they may seem, without the permission of our risen and all-conquering Lord. Isn't that a comforting thought to the people of God tonight? And especially when times are dark. And times seem to be spiraling out of control on man's part. Man's not in control. He thinks he is. But God is. What about the riches? What does it mean? Treasures of darkness. Is that a misprint? It seems very contradictory. That which darkness is often associated with is fear and evil. John 3 and 19, for example, men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. How much rascality goes on under the cover of darkness. But God says here, I will give thee the treasures of darkness. Let me suggest what some of those riches might be. It's through darkness that man is unable to put things in the right perspective. The days are getting shorter. They're gone. In about 21 days or so, you'll be at the shortest day. And we're on the turn again. I always like to get into about the second or third week of January. You can see a wee length tonight. The nights are dropped down. The darkness is seen earlier. But do you ever consider, men and women, how much the darkness reveals? Do you just hypothetically consider if there was daylight 24 hours a day then we would assume that this earth was all that there was in God's universe. But the vastness of God's universe and of creation is seen when the darkness falls. And it's then we get things into perspective. It's then that we realize how small we really are in comparison to it. The psalmist sums it up, Psalm 19 and 1. The heavens declare the glory of God, the firmament showeth his handiwork. Day unto day uttereth speech, and night unto night showeth knowledge. You look up into the darkness when you leave tonight, and we're able to see something of the power and the mind of our great creator, God. You can see it best of all, and you're in the country as I am now. And that's what the psalmist was led to consider in Psalm 8. The words of verse 3 and 4. He says, When I consider thy heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars which thou hast ordained, what is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that thou visited him? He's just taken up with the awe of God. The power of God that he created these, these things, these galaxies with his fingers. It's the darkness, men and women, that reminds us that we are just a speck of dust in God's sight. And yet how great our God really is. And the mystery of it all is this, that he should be mindful of us. 
not a speck of dust. You know, darkness also produces growth. A favorite enticement of parents back in my day to get the children to bed was this. You need to go to bed because there when you, is when you grow in your sleep. Maybe you, some of you boys slept too much. And some of the rest of you were bad children. You never went to bed. I have a fella in the church and he has to kneel down to get in through the door. So I don't know where he was sleeping, maybe in a greenhouse or something. But that's, I don't know if you've ever heard that the parents used to say, go to your bed and that's where you grow. And you know, that's true in regard to other things. There are some trees and they do not grow well because they're never in the dark. The sun goes down, the lights on the street come on and they're literally exhausted. Because they're constantly in the blaze of light where there's no relief, there's no rest. And their growth is stunted. And the same, of course, is true of ourselves. God never meant us to be working all the hours of day and night. The body needs refreshment and rest. These bodies are not made. They're not made for you to work in day and night. I don't care what you are. And I, I speak to myself, men and women. But I also speak to the farmer. You're not meant to be working day and night. And the darkness helps and is causing that to happen. For Psalm 127 reminds us, he giveth his beloved sleep. Aye, but there's times when we come through some difficult affliction or dark experience and we may not see it at the time, yet afterwards we can see the riches that God gave us because of that. I think of the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, and it's well known, of course, a well known passage. He had what he described was a thorn in the flesh. And there are commentators who have suggested this, that, and the other, but none of them can be dogmatic as what that thorn in the flesh is. I throw out one suggestion it might have had something to do with his eyesight, a poor eyesight. I give one reason for that. It's because he writes in Galatians, the letter to Galatians, you see how a large letter that I've written unto you. Well, Galatians is not a large letter in terms of its length. There's only six short chapters. But it might be that he wrote large letters because of his eyesight. I just throw that out. He cannot be dogmatic. And he prayed three times for that thorn in the flesh to be removed from him. But God gave him the answer. 2 Corinthians 12, verse 7, And lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations that was given to me, a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in mine infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. That was God's answer. He gave him a better answer. The thorn in the flesh wasn't taken away, but the Lord gave him the grace to bear it. And he said, my grace is sufficient for thee. Psalm 119, verse 67 says this. The psalmist says, before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now have I kept thy word. Verse 71, it is good for me that I have been afflicted that I might learn thy statutes. Darkness, the riches of God are noted in it. You know, darkness is also noted in the plan of our redemption. They're preparing for us a heavenly home. I read in Luke chapter 23 in the words of verse 44. And it was about the sixth hour and there was a darkness over all the earth until the ninth hour. And the sun was darkened and the veil of the temple was rent in the midst. And during those hours from midday to three o'clock in the afternoon. It was the Christ of God who became sin for us who knew no sin. And God the Father could not look upon his son. 
He turned his face away. The whole Calvary and the whole earth was veiled in darkness. That's why no artist can portray exactly Christ on the cross. They have their uh, imagination and what they depict on a canvas, but they do not know because there was that darkness. And no one can see through of what was going on because there Christ had become sin as our substitute laying down his body and his life on that cross of Calvary as God the Father made the judgment for our sin to meet on him. Those sufferings of Christ on the cross were hidden beneath the darkness. But out of that darkness was accomplished a finished work. And the veil was rent in the temple, signifying that Christ had opened up a way for sinful man from the dark paths of sin. And the entrance to heaven was purchased through the blood of his cross, through his atoning death. We can never put a value on the riches and the treasures that came out of that darkness. We have everything in Christ all because of Calvary. And so we begin to understand something of what this little phrase means. The treasures of darkness, even in the most trying of circumstances, God has riches and treasures that we wouldn't have had otherwise. And I dare say if I went round the pews tonight, and I was to take you back to a very dark place in your life's experienced believer, and I asked you the question, maybe you didn't see it at the time, but I asked you the question, did God not give you riches and treasures in that time? And you'd have to admit that he did. You learned things, I learned things then, that I would never have learned. Had it not been for that low experience, or that dark experience. It is a blessing to be able to look upon those times in such a light. Let me just finish with the, the reason. The reason why Cyrus would have these treasures is so that he would know that there was the God of Israel. I will give thee the treasures of darkness and hidden riches of secret places, that thou mayest know that I, the Lord, which call thee by thy name, I'm the God of Israel. Through this experience, he would come into communion with God. It took the dark experience of a famine and the feeding of the swine to bring that prodigal son to himself. It brought him to an end of himself. And he thought again upon the father's house and what his servants had back there. That dark experience because of it meant that he would return into the blessed arms of his, of his father. An end of his embrace. You know, it took the dark experience of the storm arising while the disciples were in the boat. As we find it in John chapter 6. And the Lord stilling the waves to show them that truly he was the son of God. John 6 verse 16, And when even was now come, his disciples went down into the, sh into the sea and entered into a ship and went over the sea toward Capernaum. And it was now dark. The Holy Ghost writes that. By the human pen man, John. And Jesus was not come to them. And the sea arose by reason of the great wind that blew, so that when they had rowed about five or twenty or thirty furlongs, they see Jesus walking on the sea and drawing nigh unto the ship, and they were afraid. But he saith unto them, It is I. Be not afraid. And they willingly received him into the ship. And immediately, the ship was at the land whither they went. There's a miracle there. Immediately. It took that dark experience. Maybe the dark times are for the very reason of drawing us, his children, back to himself. Closer. We know this. That God doeth all things well. 
It is the trying and dark times that thrusts us more and more upon him. Dependent upon the Lord who cannot fail. I'm sure, like you, you maybe heard of the recent headline yesterday, was it? That our nation officially is a heathen country. First time below 50% people call themselves Christian. You've got to take that with a wee pinch of salt, or a big pinch of salt. That includes Catholicism. Officially, we're a heathen country. You think of the vast amount of false religionists that have come in. But men and women, why that may be the case, and what is a dark day spiritually? And it's a dark day in our own land spiritually. May God help us to keep looking to the one who is the author and the finisher of our faith, whatever the circumstances. Because the Lord says, I am he. I am the Lord, there's none else. And I will give thee the treasures of darkness. And the hidden riches of secret places. May the Lord do it for his own glory's sake. I trust the Lord will bless a wee word to your hearts tonight. For his own name's sake and for your encouragement. 426 will sing, change your position. Page 349, does Jesus care when my heart is pain? Do deeply for me our song as the burdens press and the Cares the stress and the day grows weary and long. Four, two, six, watch the words and we'll stand as we sing it.